Good day, students. It's me, Mark Ancelotti, again. Uh, for the next 45 minutes or so, I'm going to be working through the finance and modeling elective with you. As before, we're dividing our videos up into smaller sections so it's easier to download. So in part one, I'm going to be looking really at annuities and more of the finance aspects. In part two, we're going to play a bit with perpetuities, uh, talk recursion, see how we can model perpetuities using recursion, which obviously leads then to the initial population models. And then in part three, I'm going to predominantly look at the predator-prey model. All right, with the finance, uh, many of the formulae are exactly the same as what you've seen in core mathematics. Just remember that nominal and effective, whoops, let's just go back, nominal and effective is definitely not given on the formula sheet. And the big difference in AP is you sometimes need to convert a nominal rate to a nominal rate. So, for example, something compounded quarterly to something compounded monthly, not just nominal to effective and vice versa. Then the outstanding balance, you must know that there are two different formulae to work out the outstanding balance. Um, and this is a critical part of what we do. Whenever there is a change to an annuity, like a change of the interest rate or missed payments or anything like that, you always find the outstanding balance at the point after which you've made your last full payment. Um, and the preferred method is actually to take the loan for the number of payments minus the future value of all those payments up to that particular point. Then the final thing that we need to know is how do we calculate the final payment on a loan, especially when it's been something called a fixed payment annuity. So if we've chosen the payment, then the last payment is not necessarily the same as all the others. Usually it's a slightly smaller amount and we need to be able to help, but we need to know how to be able to do that. All right, let's just go through a couple of examples. So first of all, let's start with something nice and easy. Sum of money is invested for 12 years. Great. For three years, the interest rate is 12% per annum. For five years, it goes to a monthly rate. And then for four years, it goes to a quarterly rate. After 12 years, there's five times as much in the account. Please remember, you don't need to put in any particular values. If you start off with P, then you know 12 years later, you would end up with 5P. If you start off with 100, you'd end up with 500. It doesn't matter. It's really the ratio that we're playing with here. The other point that I want to make here is that we are being asked to find R. Please note that R will be an annual rate, okay? It's going to be an annual rate, but it is a nominal rate. So it'll be per annum, but linked to a compounding frequency, which of course will be compounded quarterly. And then they say to me, what constant annual interest rate would have yielded the same return? So really we're just saying, if we did this whole calculation, annually over the 12 years and we went from p to the 5p what would the rate have been and actually part two is significantly easier than you may have initially first thought so let's look at my solution here so i'll start off by creating my kind of timeline my equation remembering that we're trying to solve for this r but because they said to me that it is being compounded quarterly you know that you would have been dividing this R by 4, and it was being done for 4 years, and hence the exponent is going to be 16. I've then just gone and showed how I'd go and simplify. I've divided the brackets across. I've taken the 16th root. I can go and do all sorts of steps. Please remember that your rate right at the end, I'd strongly encourage you, is not just 15.56%. It's 15.56% per annum. It's an annual rate. But because it is nominal, we should also be stating here compounded quarterly. But I just want to remind you that once in AP, once you have got your initial equation, you are allowed to just go and solve on the calculator and use that equation tool. So all of this working, whilst it's really nice and I'm a mathematician and I want to show that, you are allowed to just go and click shift and then solve using the calculator. Just, of course, make sure you've got to get rid of those P's first. And then this R, when we plan the calculator, is going to be the unknown X. But I, I know at this stage in your matric careers, you're quite comfortable with that. And then what annual rate would have yielded the same return? We were just going to get five times as much money. We know we're doing it over 12 years. This was an annual rate. Easy peasy. Let's look at another one. 
a new Mercedes can be bought this year for 650,000 and it depreciates at a rate of 21% per annum. A new Mazda currently costs 180,000 and the cost of a new one is increasing at 7.5% per annum. After how many years and months will the cost of the old Mercedes be equal to the cost of the new Mazda? So what we're seeing is the one is depreciating and the other one is increasing in price from a lower base and at some point we've got to go and solve where they'll be equal to each other. Now obviously we're solving for N and the time to depreciate and the time to increase in price is going to be exactly the same so they will line up quite beautifully and what you've got to do is you've got to create an equation. I hope you'd be comfortable and you would get to this first line over here. So we're depreciating at 21% for a certain period of time and this Mazda at 180,000 is increasing at 7.5% and we equate it there. Again, because I'm a mathematician, I want to show my working. So I divided the 180,000, I divided the bracket with the n's, and we know this clever exponent law that if we've got two fractions raised to the same power, we can then divide the fraction parts first and keep the power on the outside. And then from there, we would go and create a log and solve. But as your teachers would have said to you at school, from this very first line, if you want to, you're going to get exactly the same amount of marks and you're going to be working incredibly faster use the solve button so the marks are for the creation of the equation not the computation right at the end use a calculator to solve so example three this is an interesting example to test your understanding of what you're seeing and an understanding of an annuity so it says a man takes out a loan to be repaid over 10 years he pays nothing for the first two years then he starts paying with a regular monthly payment, so there's your annuity, so it would start be, it will start bringing the balance down. After six years, he makes a large cash injection, so he's making one big deposit that will reduce the balance, and then he adjusts his monthly payment so that the loan is still paid over 10 years. Make a sketch. So let's see what I've done over here. So the examiner would have wanted to see that you were growing your loan for the first two years because you made no payment. And remember, this is exponential growth. So we want to see this exponential graph. It's not linear. Then in the same way, if you start paying off and you're paying up until the sixth year, okay, we want to see this depreciating. Remember, this is on a reducing balance because you're paying back regularly. It's not linear. When you're paying off a loan, initially you make very little impact um, to reduce the, the outstanding balance. And then over a period of time, it starts getting traction. So it gets a little bit steeper. Here is where we've made our large cash injection. So instantaneously, you need to see that the balance has dropped. And then again, I'm paying a regular amount so that I amortize the loan. So I know that it was going to end at zero after 10 years, and it's that gentle curve. Okay, so of course, there are different variations of this, but this is just illustrating an understanding of what's happening when you're not paying, or when you are paying, or when you're making a big deposit. Example four. If inflation is 0.5% per day, what is the equivalent effective per annum rate? Almost certainly in the finance, we're going to be playing a bit with rates. But I just want to reiterate or reinforce something with you. When we're talking about R, when you substitute it into a formula, you've got to understand that we're dealing with something called the rate per period. And that is critical. So if you're doing something quarterly, you would take that eight, that R to divide it by four. So this rate now becomes a rate per quarter. Okay. So we always want to find the rate per period for any calculation. So if you're doing a daily, you want a rate per day and so on and so forth. Please look at the careful wording in this question. It says if inflation is 0.5% per day, this is a rate per day. So you're not dividing it by 365. You've got to realize that that has already taken place. It's not a rate per annum compounded daily. This is a rate per day. So actually, your R would have been some rate which you would have divided by 365, and that would be a rate per annum compounded daily. And then that will give you 0.5% per day. So please understand it has already been modified. 
So when you look here, of course, nominally effective, you know this formula so well from core mathematics, but it's over here that I did nothing because I already had the rate per day and I didn't divide by 365. It was already divided. And then I get my answer. Okay, let's look at Megan. Megan is investing 5000 at the end of each month into an account giving compound interest with an effective return of 11% per annum. Straight away you want to highlight that in your exam. Because what we're seeing is an effective rate, but Megan is now paying monthly. Okay, and we've got to understand is that the rate actually has to correspond with the payment frequency. So if you're paying monthly, we need to be working with a rate per month, a rate, a, a monthly rate. If you're paying daily, you need a daily rate. So we've got an effective rate. So first things first, I've got to convert a rate. But then understand, I'm going to be paying an annuity, I'm going to be paying an annuity. After four years, the rate changes. What we should have learned is that this annuity carried on. But after four years, it stops. We then create a new annuity, and that will take me to the finish line. Okay, and this finish line is after 10 years. So this new annuity would be taking me to the finish line. But we've got to understand that the other annuity, which had stopped when the rate changes, must compound to the finish line as well. So it's almost like this is a fixed deposit. Okay, maybe that's more familiar for you. And this, when this annuity stops, if there's a change to the interest rate or there are additional payments or anything that changes an annuity, the annuity is stop, must stop. So the annuity would have stopped. I will compound that amount to the finish line and then the new annuity will just go to the finish line. Let me show you what I mean. So first things first, we had an effective rate and I had to go convert this to a nominal rate per month. Please make sure that you store it. I've shown it to two decimal places, but I definitely didn't keep it to two decimal places. I kept the full rate on my calculator. This is not a final answer, so you're not allowed to round off early. You can only round off on the very, very last line. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to do this annuity for four years at this rate, but we realized that there was still another six years where it had to compound to the finish line, which is why we're seeing this bracket over here. And then the 5,000 Rand for the next six years was being compounded as an annuity to the finish line. And we add these two parts together. Please don't forget this bracket because the money doesn't just sit there. The money continues to compound at the new rate because after four years, the rate changed. For example six, we're going to start playing around with a couple of things now. We've got a loan. Uh, 1.85 million taken out to be repaid in 15 years time. I just need to write down 15 is 180 payments. Um, and the first payment will be made after six months. What we have here is something called a deferred annuity. A deferred annuity is where you put off paying until some particular period later on in time. A normal annuity is where your first payment is made at the end of the first period. So if, for example, you're paying half yearly and your first payment is after six months, that's perfect. Everything lines up and you do nothing to the formula. So your first payment should always be at the end of the first period. But you were paying monthly and now you're only paying after six months. So this is what we do. To line up everything with a deferred annuity is you grow the initial loan the number of missed payments. This is really important. So you make your first payment after six months. That means you have missed five payments. So now I'm going to have to grow my loan, this initial 1850, that's no longer the initial loan. It's got to grow because you haven't paid for five months. And then I'm going to be paying off my loan but remember, they said it's repaid in 15 years' time. Well, five months have already gone by. So actually, I'm going to have to say 180 minus the five that have already gone. 
So I've actually only got 175 payments in which to pay off the loan. I'll get to that shortly. Then at B, it says to me, okay, what percentage of the loan is left to pay after eight years? This really is going to be a balance outstanding. And we just work out what is the balance outstanding after eight years versus the initial loan. And we'll just go and work out a percentage there. Um, then C, after eight years, the rate reduces. So all that we're going to do is we're going to take the balance outstanding because we've already calculated it after eight years. And it says how many more months if the payments remain the same? Oh, we're just going to go and solve for N, which is really an easy part. And then they ask us to find that final payment X. That is important. And that is very much where AP differs from core mathematics, where we're going to find this final payment for a fixed uh, payment annuity. But anyway, let's go and look at these examples. So what's the value of my monthly payments? Have a look here. This over here is the loan amount. You see, your loan grew for five months because you missed five payments. You only started making a payment after the sixth month. And we needed to realize, hang on, there were 15 years, which is 180 payments, but I've got to take away these five payments that have already taken place. What's the original loan left to pay? Oh, sorry, percentage of the original loan. So find the balance outstanding. So to find the balance outstanding, what we usually do is we take the loan and we compound it to the point in the future. So it needed to be compounded for eight years minus the future value of all the payments made up to that particular point in time. Now you'll notice in this instance that the 96 and the 91 are not the same. So the loan would have grown for eight years but we only had future value payments over here for the eight years less the five that were missed at the beginning. But please note this formula. You cannot use the other formula where you work backwards. Generally speaking, this will always work. The other one will not always work. So we grow the loan for the number uh, up to the particular point in time, which is eight years minus the future value of all those payments that would have been made up to this particular point in time. And then this over here is the outstanding balance that I'm going to be using in part C. But they also said to me, what percentage of the original loan has been paid? So then, or is remaining, sorry. And then I'll just divide this by the original amount and get a percentage. Now they say, how many more months for the loan to be repaid? So I know I'm just going to be solving for N. So over here, this was the balance outstanding after eight years, because they said to me, after eight years, the rate changes, and I just go and solve for N. Now, it's really interesting to note how we interpret this answer. 68.69, it doesn't say it's 68 and 69% of a payment. No, this is 69% of the period. It's quite different. You can't ever take that as a percentage of a payment. It's part of the period but it's telling me that there were 68 full and this represents one smaller payment so students always say to me how do i answer that and i say well it depends on how the question is asked if they say how many payments there are actually 69 payments if they said how many full payments there are only 68 full payments uh, what did they say to me they said after how many months Will it have been paid off? Well, it's going to be 69 months, 69 payments. And then sometimes in brackets, I do that to cover myself. There's 68 full payments and one smaller payment. Now, here's the challenge. How do we find the final payment amount? What this formula represents here is the balance outstanding after the final full payment. Because you know that there's going to be one further payment so this n minus one just says you know where we got 68 comma something blah 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 so we're saying there were 69 payments take away one from that 69 which means there was 68 full so really we're saying grow the loan for 68 months minus the future value of 68 months and what this is doing is it's giving you the balance outstanding leading into the last month of your loan then if you grow it for one month, that'll tell you exactly what was owing at the end of the last month, which is what your final payment will be. Okay, so look what I do. 
is I take the initial loan. This was the loan that we had after eight years. Grow it for the 68 months where you're making full payments minus the future value of the 68 full payments. Grow that for one month. That then would have told me exactly what I'm owing at the end of the 69th month, which then is that last payment that you make to amortize the loan. And let's go to this last question, example seven, before we take a short break. It says a loan of 2.55 million is taken and is repaid in monthly installments over a period of 14 years with interest calculated 10.5% per annum compound and monthly. Great, it's a nominal rate linked to a compound and frequency, everything's great. Calculate the initial monthly payment. This is nice and easy. You should get full marks there. But we always get asked that because we need it for part B, because we're going to then see there are some missed payments. So it's quite similar. If you're making additional payments or you have missed payments, you always find the balance outstanding. That is a critical component in this course, the financial part of it. So we find the balance outstanding at the last time where we made a full payment. So if you're missing the 37th, all right, then we're going to find out the balance outstanding after the 36th month. And then what will happen is that's where we would have been as a loan. We forget about everything before that. We say the new loan amount after 36 months is this, and now it starts growing because you're missing some payments. So we grow it for the number of missed payments, just like we did with the deferred annuity. And then we put everything back into the annuity formula and say, well, how many months are there left over? We start paying from the 40th month. We'll work out how many months are left and we'll then go and work out that monthly installment. So the initial payment, nice and easy. Okay, 14 years, there are 168 payments. Easy game. Now we're finding the outstanding balance after the 36th month because we're missing the 37th payment. So you always have to find the balance outstanding after your last full payment. So remember, grow the loan for the number of months leading up to that minus the future value of the full number of payments up to that particular point. So this is what my loan is after 36 months. I forget about everything that's taken place before and this is now my new value going forward. But now I miss the 37th, the 38th, and the 39th. So I've got to grow my loan, okay, for three months, for three missed payments. Please understand that I haven't rounded off any of these values. I probably should have put dot, 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 and dot, dot, dot. But I know my working. You see, these are not final answers. I'm storing everything on a calculator. Then what I've got to say to myself is, all right, this is now my loan. So it goes over there. I'm going to be making a whole lot of payments to take it to the finish line at my rate. And I just want to let you know, well, we had 168 payments because it was initially over 14 years. Remember, we've taken away 36 months because we found the balance outstanding after the 36 payment. Take away the three that you had already missed, which means that there were still 129 payments that could be made that would then amortize the loan. All right, take a short break. When we return, we're going to get into part two. See you shortly.